So I've done a couple of videos lately on working with precision in Blender and how I do it in my daily workflow. And the question came up a couple of times of how to get a print ready drawing out of it. So I want to address that today. Getting a print ready drawing with dimensions or a good line drawing as a vector file is not something Blender can do natively. So we'll have to use an add-on for that. And there is a nice little add-on that is completely free called Measure It Arc. It's mostly based on Blender's built-in add-on Measure It, but it's got a bunch more options, including making drawings. And I'll walk you through all the steps on how to get a render with measurements and annotations and even a vector line drawing. So first, of course, we have to download it. So head on over to GitHub and under code download the zip file. The link to that is in the description. If you scroll down, there's also a somewhat decent documentation on the on the add-on. So if you do end up using it, make sure to give that a quick fly over for things I may not touch on today. Now, after you downloaded it, open up Blender and go under Edit Preferences. And under the little drop down here, install from disk, look for your add on and install the zip file. And then you will find it under measure it arc. Make sure the little check mark is toggled. And once you install it successfully, you will find it in your end panel and there you can work with it. Most of the global settings for this add on will be found under the scene properties tab where you can adjust the units, the precision for it. Uh, you can set up different views for it for all different cameras, styles for lines, annotations and dimensions and all kinds of global settings for the add-on. And we'll go through most of the stuff as we go along. Now with the add-on still being in development, it does work with the current version of Blender, which at the time of this recording is 4.2.3, but it also still has quite some quirks. But for the most part, it works. No rhyme intended. So before we go into the wickets of it all, let's look at the basics first. So I got this simple object here to show you a few options. First, let's add a dynamic line group to it. So the first thing I got to do is click on show, similar to the regular measure it add on. Otherwise, nothing will show up. And then with my add object selected here, I can click on dynamic line group. And if you have that arrow with the eye toggled here, it will be highlighted in case you have several objects in the scene. If you deactivate the object, you can see that black line group and it will use the crease value of the edges to determine which edge to draw a line on. Now, if we go under object properties here and scroll down a little, we can see it's using the default line style one. And if I unlink that now, I can change all kinds of settings. Like for example, I can tell it to draw hidden lines or even change the color. So if I uncheck this so we can see the color of the lines, I can now give it a nice red color or orange or let's make, let's make it red. Down here where it says under the line one settings filter by group, it is supposed to work with uh, vertex groups, but that seems to be still in development because I get I can't get it to work. So if I wanted to add more edges to a different line group, I can tap into edit mode and select, for example, these lines here and click on line group by selection. And now I can see these lines have a line group too, and I can individually change the settings for that group. So next we can add measurements to our object and I recommend telling it a view plane first. Otherwise the measurements will just constantly follow your view and that gets annoying quite quickly. So if I go into top view here and make the view plane, the X and the Y, the X and the Y, and I'm going to tap into edit mode and go from this vertex to this vertex and click aligned. I now have my measurement there. I can also go along a slope aligned. Or if I want to know how far this one is away from there along one axis, I can keep these activated and go along the axis. And on this little drop down here, I could choose which axis to use. Now we also have the option to get an angle via three vertices and also an arc via three vertices. And then under dimensions here, we can always change the settings because the arc doesn't have a default style. So that's a little thick. So let's just reduce the line weight there a little. And on that one, we can also change if we want to have the length of the radius or if we want the angle. And additionally, we can choose a face and give that an area measurement. And there you can uh, unlink the style and change the color of the overlay and you can also Tell it to not fill it at all or completely fill it out. So I'm just going to leave it at 0.5. 
Now here's one of the big quirks. For the angle arc and area to appear in the right spot, the object origin seems to have to be at the world origin. Otherwise, if for some reason, it just appears at the world origin, even though the object is completely somewhere else. So for example, if I add a cube here quickly or a plane and just move this over here, now the object origin comes with the plane and I go into face mode and give that an area. Now, if I hide this object here, the, uh, the area measurement appears in the world origin. Now, if I go into object mode and move the uh, origin to the 3D cursor, which is at the world origin right now, then all of a sudden the, the area measurement appears in the right spot. I don't know why, but it's just what it is. So for the same reason, if I want all these measurements to move along with the object, if I move it, I have to move everything in edit mode. So the origin remains in the world origin. Otherwise, if I move it in object mode, the, the aligned and axis measurements move along fine, but the area arc and angle, they just remain where they were. I don't know why that is, but I'm pretty sure it'll get fixed at some point. So let's do a deeper dive into it with a simple floor plan. On more complex scenes, we have to do a little bit of prep work and we'll get to that later. For now though, let's say we want to extract and print measurements from here. Now for most things to work properly, we need to have an active camera in the scene. Otherwise it just won't show up. And I've set up a couple here already, one for top view, front view, and right side view. And they are all orthographic for a decent plan view since we want to make drawings. So let's pop into the scene properties first and set up some views for the cameras for later printing. So under views here, I'm not gonna click on the plus icon and add two more views and I'm gonna assign my cameras to it for the top, the front, and the right. Now under viewed settings, we can adjust a couple things. So I'm gonna ignore the render engine and the view transform for these cameras because I'm, I'm just worried about drawings and nothing else. Now, once you've saved your file in the folder, you can tell the add-on under output path to create a subfolder where it will store images and vector drawings. And you can even tell it to make a date folder or a name folder if you want to. Now under resolution type, we can choose paper or pixels. Pixels will refer back to your scene setup and how you have the output property set up, or you can go for paper sizes. So let's say we want to have an A3 drawing and we want to have that in landscape. Now you can set the uh, print resolution and the scale mode. And I'm just going to bring this up a little so we have enough room for our measurements. So I'm going to bring it up to about 35 and it should be good. And we can do that individually for all of them. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna set them all to the same. I'll set that to 35. This one here is good at 25, I believe. Yeah, that should be good. Okay, now if we scroll a little down under styles, we can set global styles for dimensions, annotations, and line styles. Uh, personally, I usually use um, one of the default ones. And for dimensions, I usually add another one, but we'll do that in a little bit here. And if we scroll down a little further, we can see all kinds of other global settings. Uh, the one I usually toggle is hide the units because I know I work in millimeters and all the rest, I usually don't even touch them. So let's go in and create some lines. So I'm going to tap into edit mode and do that on the side view here. And in x-ray, I'm going to select all the vertices along the top. And I'm going to hit line group by selection. And for that, I can use the uh, regular style, the standard one. But then I also want to have lines on this side here. And here, I can decide which lines I actually need. So what I actually need is all the outside lines and the ones around the windows. So I'm going to select all the edges along the outside and the ones around the window. And again, line group by selection. And now in order to see the difference, I'm gonna unlink the style here and give that a different color. Let's make this a bit of an orangey one. I'm gonna do the same thing on this side here where I have the door. I'm gonna select all the edges along the outside, the ones around the window, and the ones around the door. And again, line group by selection. I'm gonna unlink the style and give this like a bluish color. So now if I go into my camera view and switch through my different cameras, I can tell exactly which group is which. And now we can start giving it some measurements. I'll only do a few because the process is always the same. So let's go back to the scene properties quickly. 
and look at our dimension styles. And similar to a cap program, you can have different styles here. I'm going to leave the standard style as is, and I'm going to add a personal one. So I'm going to click on that little plus icon here and choose dimension. And I'm going to call this carpenter. And then I can open this little drop down here and change the settings. I'm going to choose a font. I'm going to use Korea New Bold. Uh, font size 18 is fine. Line weight 25 is okay too. The view plane I leave at none. I choose that in the add on panel itself, depending on where I want them. And I'm going to choose dashed as the arrow start and end and bring the size up to 10. I'm also going to give this a blue color, which always looks good on paper. So let's pop into edit mode and give it some dimensions. I'm just going to go along the top edge here. So first I want the uh, overall dimension of the whole wall. So I'm going to select this vertex and this vertex. I still have the X and Y plane active from earlier. So that's okay. And I'm going to choose my carpenter as the style in this area and hit aligned. And there's my measurement. Now I can go into object properties here and I have my first dimension here. And if I open this drop down here under dimension one settings, I can tweak the distance so I can make some room here. It's going to bring it up to like 500 or something so I can get all the other ones in between. Now I want to know what this distance is here. And if I select this vertex and this vertex, now I have to go along the X axis. So I'm going to choose axis and then I can continue to go along. Now in a case like this here, we can go into the last dimension here and we can either tweak the distance or we can try to mitigate it with the uh, position of the text to offset that a little if it doesn't fit in between the lines. And just like that, we have all the measurements for the top side here. Now, if I want to go into the side view here and want to grab, for example, the height dimensions for the window. All I got to really keep in mind is that I have to change the view plane from, in this case, it would be the, uh, let's get out of the camera view quickly. That's the X and the Z axis. So let's change that to X and Z. And then again, like we did before, we can go aligned, aligned and aligned. And that way you can get measurements from your whole drawing and the process is the same over and over again. Just always keep in mind to change the view plane first, but I'm sure you get the gist of it now. So I'm going to head back to scene properties here and make sure view one is activated. And then if I go over to my output properties, I can see all these new buttons that have appeared here. So image will render all the uh, lines and measurements as a PNG file. And there's a use for that, which I'll show you in a little bit. But to get a nice SVG drawing, line drawing, we have to click vector. Now I've never touched the animation buttons. From what I know, they're a little unstable and I personally don't need vector drawings as, a, as an animation. So at this point, we got to save our file here, make a save, and then we can hit measure it arc vector. So this will generate a nice vector file, which we can then throw at our vector program of choice, whether that's Inkscape or Affinity Designer. And in there, we can make a whole bunch of changes to it if we want to, like change the font size, line thicknesses, etc. And we can do that for all our view setups. We just have to make sure that under the scene properties, the, the view is active and the add-on will then name the output file accordingly. So that's the simple case. But before I get into the more complex example, I want to address one thing that I just know will come up. Why don't I use Bonsai, the add-on formerly known as Prints, uh, Blender BIM? Well, it's actually pretty simple because it's not simple. And what I mean by that is Bonsai, as great as it is, is a very complex add-on. For one, to cover it here would be way too extensive for one video. Uh, I might consider a little mini series on it down the line. Uh, I don't know yet, but more importantly, I don't need it in my daily workflow. For my cabinetry business, it's not needed to create IFC data for my drawings. Uh, if I were to work with architects or on building projects in general, yes, I would turn on bonsai in a heartbeat. But for my needs, 99% of the time, this add-on here is plenty good enough. Plus the drafting feature is also still in development. So bonsai is awesome and I look forward to where it's still go. But for my daily needs, it's just too much. 
So let's now look at a little more complex scene where I have this kitchen set up and let's say a client needs not only a render but also a drawing with measurements to tell the electrician for example where to install the power for the uh, stove. So I'm gonna make an incremental save here because I want to make a couple of changes to the scene for optimization for our drawings. So first thing of course is setting up a camera so for that I go into front view and I'm gonna shift a add a camera and control alt numpad zero to bring it into my view and I'm going to change it to autographic. I'm going to change the scale a little so everything is in view. I'm going to make sure I have enough room on the bottom because that is where I'm going to place all my measurements. So with my camera set up I'm going to make a quick render and once that is done I can start optimizing my scene for dimensions and line drawings because right now it has quite a few elements in it that we just don't need for that purpose. First of all, I don't need to show the poles for it. So off they go. And here you can see how beneficial it is to stay organized because I can just deactivate the whole collection and be done with it with one click. Next, I also don't need the fronts. For one, with all these inset, it would get way too crowded on the drawings. And second, they are smaller than the cabinet bodies. So for the purpose of getting dimensions, they're completely irrelevant. So off they go to. And same goes for the floating shelves and the appliances. Now for the cabinet bodies, because I sized them with hook modifiers, I need to now go in and apply those hook modifiers. Because the measure it arc add-on would not recognize that even if I show it on cage. So I'm just going to go through these quickly and apply my hook modifiers. And there's one more quirk with modifiers, which I'll get to in a little bit. So for now, though, let's add some dimensions. And I'm going to go back into front view for that and go back to my measure it arc add-on. Activate it by clicking show. And now I'm going to start off with the wall. So I'm going to get into edit mode. I'm going to start off with the overall dimension. And I'm going to make sure that my X and Z plane is active here. And I'm going to choose my carpenter style and hit aligned. And now in that dimension, I got to tweak the distance. I'm going to bring that way down like 1500. So I have enough room for everything else. So now I can get my partial dimensions on that wall. And same thing, I just got to tweak the distance. For these ones, I'm going to go down to like 1300 and just go along quickly. And here is another case where we have to change the position of the numbers. Well, now I can do the same thing for all the cabinetry. I'm just going to give it dimensions for the individual elements. And I just have to go into edit mode on each one of them and select my vertices and give them the dimension. Now, if I want the distance between two objects, the add one will measure from the object origins. So I have to be aware of where these origins are and move them if needed. Like in this case, if I want to have a distance between these two panels, the origin is currently at the center. So I'm going to have to move them onto the outside faces. So I can easily do that in object mode. I'm going to go under options here and affect only the origins. And I'm going to hit GX 9.5 because I know it's a 19 millimeter panel. And I'm going to do the same thing over on this one here. GX 9.5 minus. And that way I have the origins on either side of the gap. I'm going to turn this off again. And now if I select my two panels here and hit aligned, I get the exact measurement in between those two. I can bring that down here and have it aligned with all the other ones. Now, as an addition, I could also make a couple of loop cuts in my wall here to get a vertex roughly in the middle where the stove would be. Something like this. And then on this vertex here, I can add an annotation. And I'm just going to unlink the style and adjust everything myself because right now it would be somewhere over here. We can't give it a view plane. So I'm just going to adjust my settings for that. So first and foremost, I'm going to bring this over. I'm going to set the X offset to zero. I'm going to align the text to my camera, set it to center and also adjust the uh, Z value. I need to bring it all the way back there. So I can also give this a little bit of a, a dot by choosing an end cap and make this way smaller. 
And then I just have to change the text of the annotation by calling it stove. And now I have a beautiful annotation there and I can give it the same kind of blue that I have on the measurements and it'll match. So with all these dimensions added, we can now head to the output tab and click image render. And this is where it gets cool. So let's pop over to the compositor where our initial render is waiting. And now we can overlay the dimensions onto that render. So let's shift a bring in a input image node. And in the little drop down here, search for the measure it arc output. Now, if we preview this and switch this over to the viewer node, we can see our dimensions here and the annotation. So now if we bring in an alpha over node and check convert pre-multiplied and plug our dimensions into the second socket, now we have a beauty render with dimensions. Now for a PNG, I would recommend to adjust the line thickness a little, so it's a little more visible. Just for the example, you see it works and it's pretty handy. Now, of course, from a technical standpoint, it's not the best. So for other traits, a line drawing would be better. So let's add that quickly. So I'll head on over back to the layout tab. And if you render an image, it sometimes gets these scaling issues. So all you got to do is click your object and then just unlink and relink the style quickly and it'll reset. That's a little annoying, but So now, like we did with the floor plan, we just have to select our objects and add line groups to them. However, there is one more quirk to consider when it comes to modifiers. For some reason, any bevel modifier with a bevel bigger than one millimeter breaks the line function. I'm not sure why one millimeter works just fine, but anything bigger just breaks it and it won't show up. So if an object has a bevel modifier that has a value bigger than a millimeter, we have to deactivate that modifier first before we can add our line. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to do it on the wall first, which is the easiest. I'm just going to activate it and say dynamic line group. I'm just going to go with the standard. And then on this one, for example, on this panel, there is a case where we have a bevel modifier with a two millimeter bevel and it just would not show up. If I add a dynamic line group here, it just won't show. Now, if I delete that line group here and deactivate the bevel modifier and add another line group here, now it shows up. I don't know why it is, but that's the way it is. So I'm just gonna deactivate all the bevels and everything. Even the one millimeter ones, I'm just gonna deactivate them. And I'm just gonna go through all the objects quickly and add the lines. So now I'm perfectly set up for a line drawing, but before I head to the output tab, I should set up a view. Otherwise it could get some scaling issues when you output the SVG file. So I'm just gonna head over here and I'm gonna select my camera and check the view settings. So I'm gonna ignore the render engine. And the reason I didn't set up the view before is because it would render with this render engine setting here. Even if I change it to cycles, it uses like an old standard or something and it completely overrides what we initially set up for render engine. That's why I don't set this up when I wanna do a beauty render with measurements. So let's check the paper size. Let's go A3, landscape is fine, everything fits. Head on over to the output tab, hit vector, and then we can see here it rendered the view one SVG. And if I open that now, I have a beautiful vector file that I can easily print or send to somebody. So that's how you can get dimensions and line drawings out of Blender and onto paper. It's got its quirks, but it does the job. And for what I need it for, it's sufficient. Now, if you're wondering what I was talking about sizing stuff with hook modifiers, I have a whole video about the process on the channel, which you can watch by clicking right here and I'll explain everything there. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.